Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and really a warm welcome to all of you. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Ju Chang Tam. I'm the director of the uh, Electoral Regulation Research Network. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet, the uh, Wanju people of the Kulin Nation, and uh, pay respects to their elders past and present. I was reflecting on this introduction today, and I thought, like, you know, what the acknowledgement of country in which this is done, you know, and often in events like these, is that, uh, of course, acknowledges the indigenous people. <coughs> but what it also does, very, very mildly, is really gesture to the colonization that's occurred in this country. Yeah? But what it also does, perhaps even more mildly, if not at all, is gesture the fact that colonization is necessarily a system of tyranny. Yeah? So we think about colonization, whether in this country or any other country, this possession of indigenous peoples is written in the DNA of colonization. So we've had in this country dispossession of land, dispossession of families, dispossession of culture, dispossession of lives. And that dispossession too clearly carried on to the political sphere and extended the question of political power. So as is reasonably well known, yeah, the uh, Commonwealth Franchise Act, uh, the, the act that laid down the voting rights for, for the people of the Commonwealth, uh, disenfranchised indigenous people, and it was only not until about six decades after federation in 1962 that indigenous people, unless they were protected by Section 41 of the Constitution, received the ability to vote. And it's not until 1984 there was formal equality reach where compulsory enrollment and compulsory voting applied to indigenous people. Now what's perhaps less well known is that this actually need not have come to be. And indeed, when you look at the original Commonwealth Franchise Bill, there was no exclusion of indigenous people. In fact, they're going further, there was no exclusion uh, that Australia became very notorious, uh, uh, infamous for exclusions of people of Asiatic origins. So Senator Richard O'Connor was the minister introducing the Commonwealth Franchise Bill, who later became uh, High Court Justice Richard O'Connor, was actually quite a proud supporter of voting rights for indigenous people. And he gave me quite a number of reasons, and two are worthwhile reflecting upon, and this is, these are arguments made in 1900, yes, okay? He said that the exclusion of aborig aborigines, and that's the term he used then, who were settled members of the community was not worthy of serious consideration. Now the second, second uh, another reason that's really worthwhile even reflecting upon in the 21st century, he said it would be, to quote, a monstrous piece of savagery to deny Aborigines whose land we were occupying any right to vote in their own country on racial grounds. 1900, yes? Now, as you know, then what, has, what he said and what he proposed did not come to be. And the government, which was a minority government, to secure passage in the Senate, uh, passed a, the parliament passed a law that actually had this exclusion that Australia uh, is notorious for. Now, there's a little bit of history, I suppose. And the history tells us, I suppose, about the differences in terms of what occurred then and what occurred now but also the question that persists. And the question that persists is about having a meaningful voice for indigenous people in this country. Whether through voting rights, or even with formal inclusion through voting rights, uh, through other mechanisms, whether through elections, or so on and so forth. And it's this question uh, that our panel, our very distinguished panel, uh, is gonna to address today, yeah? Securing a meaningful voice for indigenous people in elections. And um, we've got a panel whose bios run into pages, and I won't go through all that, yeah? Okay, and you, I'm sure you would have read them uh, looking at the flyer for the seminar. Um, so, just very briefly, and, uh, and in the sequence that they will speak, and they'll speak each for about 15 minutes or so, and then we'll open up for discussion, which I think we're we'll, uh, very much looking forward to. Um, Warren Gately, who's the Victorian Electoral Commissioner. Uh, Dr. Sana Nakata, who's a lecturer uh, uh, in the School of uh, Social and Political Science, uh, that way, yeah. Uh, Eddie Kubilo, uh, my colleague here at the law school, uh, who's a senior fellow at this law school, but really has had this amazingly varied and rich career 
uh, including chief of the uh, Aboriginal Legal Services Board, I hope I got the title right, uh, and former Northern Territory Anti-Discrimination Commissioner. So I think, uh, can you please join me in uh, welcoming our panel? <laughs> It might be easier if I, uh, if I stand up here, if you don't mind. Look, I, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the clans of the Kulin Nation. This area we now call Melbourne has long been a meeting place for the peoples of the Kulin Nation. And I would like to acknowledge their long history, caring for these lands and waters. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. Securing a meaningful Indigenous voice in elections. Now naturally, I will come, come at this from an operational perspective. I will also be honest in saying I have limited understanding of Aboriginal culture and heritage matters and the many daily challenges faced by the Indigenous community. I am not an expert in Indigenous engagement and can merely provide some observations and possible actions that I and the VEC can take to improve Indigenous electoral participation. Indigenous engagement is something that the VEC is extremely passionate about, given our goal of all Victorians actively and meaningfully participating in our democracy. However, my comments today try to consider the situational variations that exist across Australia and, with which, and within which Indigenous persons find themselves as each presents varying challenges and opportunities. So my comments cannot just reference Victorian Indigenous electors. At this point, I will acknowledge Professor Lisa Hill from Adelaide University and the Electoral Commissioners from South Australia and the Northern Territory, Mr Mick Sherry and Mr Ian Loganathan, upon whose work and comments I have drawn. Also from the VEC, Abigail Elliott, Georgia Cromedy and Ben Lucas, who have contributed to this work today. I think as I Chong alluded to, there is a complex relationship between First Nations Australians and voting rights. And these voting rights were hard won. As Juchong mentioned, Aboriginal people were not given the right to vote until 1962 and have consistently enrolled at a lower rate than non-Indigenous Australians. Currently, the national average for enrolment amongst eligible Australians is about 97%. For Indigenous Australians, that number is significantly lower at about 76% as best we can estimate. Now, Professor Lisa Hill offers that in settler states with a similar colonial history, such as New Zealand and Canada, enrolment rates among Indigenous peoples are also lower than the national average. Now, this coupled with turnout poses a problem for electoral commissions and democratic citizens alike, and it raises the question as to whether all groups are represented equally at the point of voting and whether therefore our democracy is truly representative. There are a variety of reasons for low Indigenous enrolment and voting rates, but they fall into two categories, motivational factors and facilitative factors. At a motivational level, Indigenous Australians refrain from voting for several reasons and in some electorates in Western Australia, with many dispersed and remote communities, this turnout can be as low as 69%. A few of the reasons are, there is a belief that voting endorses white sovereignty and validates colonial systems. Non-voting is seen as a form of protest or civil disobedience. There is also the belief that the indigenous constituency is too small to make a difference in the political landscape. There is no purpose, there is no reason in voting as things don't change. And there is the idea that voting is voluntary. Given the difficulty in enforcing compulsory voting, 
or the policy decision taken at the jurisdictional level not to pursue those who don't turn out in remote communities. From a facilitative standpoint, there are even more reasons Indigenous Australians aren't voting. A lack of election services in remote areas, especially in South Australia, Western Australia and the Northern Territory. And that leaves many Indigenous electors without a proper understanding of enrolment and voting processes, as well as having little information or knowledge about their candidates. There is a lack of voting information presented in Indigenous languages. And mobile voting does not cater to remote regions and the idea that a quick two hour visit to a remote community on election day is sufficient. So what can we do to ensure Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are being represented in our democracy? Discussions of Aboriginal affairs often focus on terminology surrounding closing the gap. And this kind of language can often be unhelpful as it implies there is something that needs to be fixed. Yet Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people overall are incredibly politically engaged and they have a long history of being so engaged. The tent embassy goes back to 1972. There were freedom rides in 1965. There were annual protest marches every January 26. The lobbying of governments has occurred to set up treaties across the country. The Uluru Statement from the Heart and the protests currently happening on Jab Warung country to protest the removal of sacred trees. This history of democratic engagement shows that Indigenous Australians have a loud voice and are asking to be heard. The Uluru Statement from the Heart shows that, as does the follow-up document the Imagination Declaration, written by young Aboriginal people and read at this year's Gama Festival. And given the historical relationship between First Nations Australians and voting histories, you could argue that enrolment at 77% is quite positive, given that in 1962 it was voluntary to enrol and vote. As an organisation, the VEC has a vested interest in seeing active participation by all Victorians in their democracy. And we focus especially on groups who have a history of being disenfranchised. The VEC's education and inclusion team do a significant amount of outreach with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, as well as those experiencing homelessness, those in prison, those with a disability, and people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. The VEC currently supports Indigenous engagement through a number of initiatives. We have a comprehensive reconciliation action plan. We employ an Aboriginal inclusion officer and Aboriginal democracy ambassadors that go out to communities across the state to educate and inform. We make use of the Indigenous voice by consulting with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on how best to deliver election services. And we currently fund the Corrin Gamaji Institute, which is an Aboriginal youth leadership program run by and for community out of the Richmond Football Club. There is still more work to do. So what is the answer to securing meaningful Indigenous voices in elections? As I mentioned earlier, other Western nations with a similar colonial history to ours face similar problems and are each attempting to deal with underrepresentation in different ways. One strategy is reserved seats with a separate electoral roll. This is something that is done in New Zealand. A separate Maori roll is in operation and Maori voters can choose to be on this roll or the general roll. They then elect members of parliament from seven electorates spanning the nation in a number of reserved seats. This overcomes the problem of indigenous constituencies feeling they are too small to make a difference and that they don't have the critical mass to make change. However, this model does encounter challenges surrounding our democratic principle of one vote, one value. Yet in the New Zealand context, it works. The Victorian Treaty Advancement Commission's elections of a First Nations representative body is another way 
of ensuring representation at a government level. And this election is occurring now. In Norway, the voice of the Indigenous cultural autonomy is represented by the Sami Parliament, an elected body that sits separately to the General Parliament and provides a direct path for Sami peoples to voice themselves to the government. Now these models or similar are available subject to national political will. As we look at these different structures and listen to the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, it is worth noting the state government's action to implement a process of policy self-determination. This is driven by the Victorian Aboriginal Affairs Framework, which puts the voices of Aboriginal people front and centre in improving the delivery of services upon which they draw and their outcomes. Now this framework, I note, acknowledges that it is the members of community that understand and know what's best for their community. It could be argued that often when governments have intervened in Aboriginal affairs, even with good intentions, outcomes have in many cases not been optimal. Now this is a delicate and complex space to navigate and any attempt to do so must be done respectfully, in an informed manner, and with ongoing consultation with these communities. And I think that is the word, consultation and engagement. And self-determination in the context of that Victorian government framework is, I hope, successful. Specifically on elections, we must listen patiently and seriously to Indigenous persons and their communities and understand their barriers in participating. At the VEC, we will look to undertake research into motivational and facilitating factors regarding non-voting. And that is done with and not about Aboriginal communities. We will take into account their informed opinions. Also, we will look to create a cultural protocol document that educates non-Indigenous staff in the VEC on the complex nature of many Aboriginal nations across this state and lessening misconceptions and easing the burden on Aboriginal employees to answer these questions on a regular basis. We will look to expand the use of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to educate their own communities and consider operating culturally appropriate voting centres in relevant areas and we will provide commissioned staff with insight into the everyday complexities faced by Aboriginal people. We will continue with our behind the scenes support to the elections currently underway to elect the First People's Assembly of Victoria and celebrate that as an important event both in self-determination and the wider democratic landscape. And we will work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander academics such as Sana, who is speaking here with me, who understands in great depth, as her father puts it, the cultural interface that we all navigate daily. Thank you. Um, thank you, Warwick. Um, thank you, everyone, for having me. Obviously, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on Wurundjeri country today um, and that the university has both contributed to and also long benefited from the geographic dispossession of indigen Indigenous peoples as well as their knowledges. Um, I, have a, I have notes here um, and it will echo um, a number of the comments that Warwick has already made, um, particularly around some of those motivational factors, which I'll express through my own um, perspective. But before I begin, I, I want to give a little bit of background to people who don't know me. So I'm a Torres Strait Islander and I'm also a lecturer in political science. So being in political science, I am meant to have a profound interest <laughs> in politics and voting and electoral procedures and institutions. And mostly I don't. Um, so today I'm going to try and flesh out a little bit of that in the context of um, electoral politics. And where I would um, perhaps um, go further than the kinds of issues that Warwick has raised is to really to try and draw attention to the question of representation and the assumptions that we make about what 
form of representation electoral mechanisms can produce. Um, I'm trained as a political theorist, but I'm not going to labour the sort of landscape of 25, the last 25 years of democratic theory too much. Um, but that that's something that perhaps we can open the floor to and have broader conversations about what it is we think representation does. Um, so I'm going to make a few points. I want to lay out some of the statistical and demographic information that I've had access to that I think helps to give shape um, to the ways in which Aboriginal and Islander people like myself come to have the kinds of attitudes and beliefs that we do about our participation. I am not a quantitative scholar, so I haven't put these up on the slides because this is just my accounting of publicly available data. Um, and I'd prefer someone like Francis Markham at CAPER or someone double check my numbers, but they're pretty good, I think. Um, I also want to um, make the point, I guess, that because of this context through which we've grown up and engaged in the electoral political system, is that we don't necessarily need democratic theory to explain to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples why we don't want to engage in the electoral politics um, processes. 25 years of democratic theory has responded to the sort of standard account of representation as problematic in a whole range of ways. There's been enormous moves around the um, boundary of inclusion for citizenship and political rights and moving of that boundary in various ways. Um, a lot of that supports and um, helps make sense of Indigenous and minority politics generally, but I don't think we need democratic theory to tell, explain that to us. Um, in fact, what my work is endeavouring to do is to try and use us to speak into democratic theory about some of the nuances and perspectives that, they, uh, that scholars in that field struggle to account for. And then I want to end um, with a reflection on how this lens to my personal support for a voice to parliament within the 2017 referendum council report recommendations. And I think my support for a voice to parliament is perhaps more um, nuanced and um, with caveats um, that we don't hear necessarily in the kind of advocacy work around it, but that is worth, um, I think has value. So, someone will have to time check me because I can, um, so, I am one of, according to the 2016 census, 649, 173 Aboriginal and, or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, of whom my best guess, because the census cuts age groups helpfully into a various categories that include 15 to 19, so I don't have a set of numbers of voting age. Um, perhaps the Electoral Commission has eligible voter numbers. Um, but approximately 40% of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population would be aged under 19. The majority of those aged under 18 and therefore ineligible to vote. Um, the median age of Indigenous Australians is 23, 15 years, the non-Indigenous Australians, which means that in addition to 40% of us not being old enough to vote, that once we become voting age, we have less elections to vote in. So, something around of that 650,000 people, there are around 260,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across the nation of 16 million eligible voters or what is a mere 1.6% of the national voting electorate. We also, I think, should account for the dispro disproportionate incarceration of Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders. And of the 12,000 currently incarcerated across the country, it's possible, likely, that many of those have been made ineligible to vote. And 12,000 potentially ineligible voters of 260,000 is not insignificant. So I've said numbers aren't my strength, and you know these are things that need to be distilled and checked further, but I think I can confidently say that we are a minority. Beyond these numbers, as Warwick has mentioned, um, and Ju Chong, sorry, mentioned also, um, while we've had the vote since 1962, we've only been compulsory enfranchised since 1984. 
So the practice of compulsory voting in Australia is younger than I am. The habitual normalised practice of voting, the preoccupation this country has with democracy sausages that other Australians seem to take for granted or seem to perform a kind of pride around is not necessarily something I feel. It's in this context that we understand Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are less likely to be enrolled to vote and that they're less likely to turn out as well. And I think it's important to take that seriously and not, as has happened to me in other forums, condescend to our Indigenous Australians about our lack of appreciation of citizenship rights. I do accept that across the country, I think this is important to note, that our population is not distributed evenly across electorates at the local, state or federal level. So while we may be 1.6% across the country in the Northern Territory, we are closer to 30%. Um, this is a considerable constituency. In the seat of Herbert, where I grew up, where Cathy O'Toole recently, the incumbent who lost the um, election to um, the opposition candidate, held the seat by a mere 37 votes. And in that seat, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are eight and a half percent of the population. So I can't be precise about how that translates to voters, but I think it's a lot more than 37. I can also offer the educated guess that in both Herbert and the Northern Territory, the voting cohort, the constituency has, that has the capacity to influence the outcome of the representative is much more substantial than the 0.6% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders that live in my current electorate of Jagger Jagger. So this is to say crudely that while we are a minority, it doesn't necessarily follow that collectively we don't have the electoral power in some of our seats to determine our representatives. So it's true, as has been put to me, that the Indigenous vote, if we were to all vote according to the same values and interests for the same representative, would have some power. But even here, I express caution. We can and should not, we cannot and should not assume that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have shared values and interests, nor that they will vote according to those interests. We know that many voters across democratic nations around the world often vote against their own interests. They do this for reasons that have to do with the conditions that shape publicity and media and practices of public deliberation and debate, access to quality information, um, and so on. So I don't think we can assume that a demography or a population of peoples necessarily translates into coherent collective um, collectivities that produce representatives. We also can't assume that just because our numbers will be sufficient enough in some parts of the continent to elect a representative, that those few representatives who are, who do step into parliaments are enough to shape state or nationwide agendas within the architecture of existing political parties. Our political inclusion, either as voters or as elected representatives does not displace the structuring logics and institutions of a colonising state that have held our minority population deliberately at the margins of political power for so long. So this is why for me electoral politics and participation of Indigenous peoples needs to be cast into a much broader set of scholarly conversations around what representation is. Now, I'm conscious of time, so I'm not going to go into a diatribe of democratic theory. I do that as a teacher and I won't subject you to it. Um, but I treat democracy in Australia and the power of the sovereign mostly as an empirical problem that I must contend with, rather than as any kind of normative ideal that I share in. This is not to say that I don't especially value democratic commitments to plurality in particular and to non-violence especially, but that I would point out in my experience as an islander in Australia that Australian democracy has failed over and over and over again to produce meaningful plurality and a non-violent state against my family and community. <laughs>
So the Australian political system is not my political system and my interest in it is not about perfecting it according to democratic principles. Rather, I am interested in how to limit the potential and unjustifiable harm and violence that the state inflicts upon the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. These are the effects that we feel and deal with every day, if not against our own individual bodies across our families, our communities and our land and our seas. So Australian political institutions in this sense are an enemy that I've just learned to live with. So while I value forms of democracy that value pluralism and place clear limits on state violence, I'm not here to defend or advocate for it either. Australia has failed to live up to these ideals over and over again. This is why I've argued in parts of my work that Australian democracy is deficient. It's deficient against its own ideals and principles. Um, and that it's failed ultimately to include Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people meaningfully in ways that would allow it to call itself democratic. So in that context, which I know is a deep provocation for many, I want to say that it should be read as understandable that for many Indigenous Australians, our sense of justice and our political strategies often lie in, as Warwick pointed to, the refusal of the state, okay? The refusal to legitimise a sovereignty that we do not accept to have a legitimate and author authoritative power over us. And so alternative political, um, indigenous political theories of refusal and resurgence seek to move to, demo well, not necessarily democratic, seek to move to modes of political representation that lie beyond the state itself. Having mounted that provocation and criticism, it's in this context that I come to lend appreciate and lend my full support to the particular proposal for a voice to parliament in the referendum council's report. The proposal that this voice be constitutionally protected and that it be charged with the very specific responsibility for monitoring heads of power, particularly the race power in section 122, um, redresses the limited representative capacity that Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders have at the ballot box. And in being able to redress that limited representative capacity, it has a function in being able to directly limit the authority of the state over us. It effectively introduces into the parliamentary institution the all effectiveness principle, which is that we need to be accounted for and represented in decisions that affect us rather than on a one vote, um, one person, one vote. Basis. So it's not a direct representation, it's a representative process engaged around effectiveness. Um, so the proposal, I think, presents a potential democratic innovation that is not necessarily about making that small minority count any more than we already do, but can make us heard. The need for Indigenous representation within democratic institutions is not to be pursued in my mind to perfect Australian democracy, which will never acquire the legitimacy it seeks, but rather to produce new representative functions and processes that lie beyond the ballot box. That it might hold in check the power of a politically illegitimate democratic institution built on stolen land is something that our votes will never be able to do. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you for um, inviting me, even though I tried to tell him I really have no interest in the space. But um, That's how I got into this, by trying to explain why I don't care. Um, and, I, and, and this is, this is part of my this talk, is that um, it's really not relevant to me or, or to my people. And, and I'll, without succinctly saying it, as Warwick and um, Sana did, but, um, I um, didn't know how to approach this, so I, I thought I'd just talk. I've got a huge family in the Northern Territory. I'm from the Northern Territory. And I want to acknowledge the um, traditional owners of this country. So I thought I'd just ring and send messages to all my nephews and nieces, you know, about, about 100 of them, and 
ask them if they vote and why don't they vote. And um, this, they range from um, studying here at Melbourne Uni and, uh, and all around the country and doing trades, not working, living on country, and majority of them haven't enrolled at all and don't intend to enrol. And the rea reality for them is that, you know, every time there's an election, our interests ain't represented or, or cared for really in a realistic way. And um, they also said that um, if, we, if we look at how we treated our people, we look at the intervention in the Northern Territory, the suspension of the RDA, and um, why would we vote when people don't really care? It's, it's still in train and it's been over a decade since that's been in place. Um, doesn't really give you a, a, a warrant to, um, to vote for anyone else to continue these sort of things that happen. And if we, in my space around um, incarceration and justice, um, you know, we've had the Royal Commission in Deaths and Custody, 28 years young this year. We've had numerous other reports recommendations that continue to be ignored. So uh, th this was sort of the feedback that I was getting from, from some of these um, young adults, our future Indigenous leaders. Um, and, you know, as Warwick and um, Santa pointed out, you know, there's 59% of Indigenous people are enrolled. But some of the stats is like, I think 25 to 30 actually um, vote. Yeah. Yep. So I, I think there's a reason there, and the, and the reason that continually confronts us as indigenous people to roll up anywhere is that um, we're an afterthought in this country um, and, and maybe we're at a black spot on, on, on where this country wants to go. So um, in saying that, we, we then have to look at where our people are situated in, in this country at the moment. We're the most vulnerable people um, in this country. We are the poorest, we're the sickest, we're the most incarcerated, um, you know, our education and, and, and our numeracy literacy is, is the worst in this country than, than most other Australians. Um, and that plays a huge part on, on whether you can actually make a difference in regards to a system that's outside of our own system. Um, majority of my mob who still live on country that they'd never see a white person yearly and, and they never have any interaction unless someone goes there and, and impedes on them. And, so, um, you know, and then if we then go back to some of my grandparents and that who, you know, had some, had to deal with the policies of forced removal, you know, extermination, assimilation, and currently now we're back to mainstreaming, which, you know, is a bit of everything, uh, main assimilation. And um, so basically all that leads to, um, is to um, our detriment and also leads to a mistrust of, 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 of the system and, and of, of, of everyone really outside of our own, our own people. But in saying that, I mean, uh, uh, there is some positives, which I'll get to, but the, the, the reality is Aboriginal people are, are voting from day one. We, we, on our land issues, we have land councils that we have to become, you know, vote for our representatives. Um, you know, there's, we're on, our, on our communities, we have these, um, forced um, councils on our, on, our, on our communities. And an example is in the Northern Territory where we, we, we had community government councils which were set up under the local, gov the local government act, part eight, where community government councils were set up. You could set up your council utilizing your own, um, your own cultural practices to determine how um, representatives are, are selected, um, which, which started to make a lot of headway within remote communities and people wanting to represent, have a voice, um, you know, skin groups, um, language groups were able to elect their own representatives, um, determining the way they did that but through historical cultural practices with that. And then without having to have elections, if they picked the right numbers without needing to have a vote, which usually was happened each time anyway, because they knew who were their representatives within their own skin groups, which suited them. And, and um, but in the wisdom of the territory government, when the intervention came in, they they um, got rid of those and um, had these shires in place, replaced them with shires, huge shires. And what happened is these people then lost their voice 
they lost capital items on their communities, they lost jobs, mm -hmm. and um, what happened is then the actual minister of the day at the time was um, the current senator from one of the senators from Northern Territory, Malandiri McCarthy, who she was a minister for local government at the time, as well as um, you know, as well coming from a Bororula in a remote location. She actually lost her seat because Aboriginal people came out to vote to show their displeasure. So when it's relevant to Aboriginal people, they will come out and vote. Um, and if they think they can have a say and put across. And if we look to the current, um, the past election, put your hand up if you understood the um, ballot paper. Um, I had no clue after I thought about it. I, I thought I voted for the Greens, but I voted for some other person with a similar name. But anyway, in that, in that election, um, Jacinta Price, who um, the Liberals thought would, um, you know, a Walpree woman who, who went up against Labor's um, Warren Snowden, a non-Indigenous man, um, and they thought they had, had that seat wrapped up. In fact, Warren won with a, with a, with a, a growing number from his yeah. previous um, time he, he ran. So again, Aboriginal people will come out and vote when, it, when it's relevant to them and, and they understand that they actually have a say and they will be listened to. Um, but overall, um, as um, Warwick pointed out, um, remote polling booths, um, language, you know, interpreters are very, very seldom used for, um, um, for those um, polling booths. Um, again, numeracy literacy cuts down the understanding of what the ballot is all about. Um, we have um, continued issues around funding cuts to important places like the Australian Electoral Commission who used to provide really um, go out early prior to the um, polling booths to educate the community on what's happening and, and, and all that sort of stuff. So they're the first things to go when, it's, um, when governments decide to cut is usually Indigenous programs, and, uh, which then makes it very difficult. As a former discrimination commissioner, you're also under, very <laughs> underfunded for the roles that you, you're supposed to do when it's delivering for Indigenous, and uh, in my case, discrimination. But in the Territory, as I said, it was 30% of the population was Indigenous. Um, you know, everyone still speaks language, and, and that many of them speak five dialects in English, usually the last of that. Um, so, so that's some of the issues that I see that prevent our people from participating, but not only that, when, when it comes to election, we're, we're usually the um, political football that um, mm -hmm. assists parties to win um, ele elect, you know, the, the election, not, not looking after our rights or anything like that. So um, as someone with a law degree and, and it's worked in, um, you know, in, in, in um, government, <coughs> in a position like the commissioner, um, it, it's very, um, you know, Aboriginal people, like I, I came back to Darwin after living several years in, in um, South Australia, and Aboriginal people, that, they're very smart people, they'll find where you are and, 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 your, and your number, it's silent and that they'll, they'll find it out and contact you and want to understand what the issues are and can you help them and, and all of that. But the reality is, um, we're very mistrusting of the system, and, um, and that's through no fault of our own, because we're very generous giving people, and I think um, I, I think it's a lot deeper than um, just educating people about education. And, and you know, the voice is, 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 a, is a discussion at the moment, um, and th we've had a similar voice previously, it was, um, was ATSIC, and you know, we had some, um, you know, media, bad media, you know, saying all these things that definitely weren't true and, you know, I'm doing my PhD on the Aboriginal Legal Service and um, the understanding that they took the federal government at the time to court for overstepping their, their ultra bodies in regards to administrative law and funding and that and ever since that day that they've been crucified by, go by governments and the reality was ATSIC was actually doing really well and, and making real good change, but it was a political and a, and a basically a, a agenda to get rid of them. And, and, and I think Indigenous people are finding it very difficult at the moment when we talk about the voice on, on people's perception on, on what's, what's going to happen. And um, we ourselves are sort of still battling with what that looks like. But I think overall the reality is that Australia needs to come to grips with its history and, and, and 
and, and we need to really have that discussion so we can go together with a bit of trust in regards to um, having a voice and being engaged with elections and, and, and governments. Because if we go back to the Northern Territory, we've had deputy chief ministers, we've had ministers in, in um, governments, and the reality is um, they all go there meaning well, but the reality is that, um, again, our, our interests ain't, ain't up at the top. So I just want to leave it at that. I'm um, sorry to be um, all doom and gloom, but that, that's, the, that's the outlook on, on um, some of this stuff for Indigenous people in this country. So thank you. Thank you to all three of you. I think such a powerful set of uh, uh, presentations. You know, and I think, uh, I mean, I think what Eddie said at the end, I think, is the true and fundamental fact, isn't it? That this country still has yet to come to grips with this colonial present past. Mm. Yes? Uh, and this long journey, right? Uh, that's yet to, uh, in some course, not to be embarked on. And mm. I'm reflecting as a a scholar is working in the area of law and democracy in this area, that, that there is a perception and what we call the hubris that Australia basically, and I think one scholar used to, a paragon of virtues in terms <coughs> of democracy, yeah? You know, so there'll be various things people pop in and say, you know, all right, one of the first few countries to give women the right to vote, uh, compulsory voting, and, and, you know, and secret ballot. The secret ballot is in fact called the Australian ballot in the United States. So, it, it's true these things are to be proud of, right? But it's not just a black spot, isn't it? Something more than a spot, yeah. here, isn't it? That's this huge, um, uh, and so I think it's important to actually appreciate achievements while realizing that they actually were built upon and still be fused by colonization. And the other thought that came to mind was simply this, that I think the perception is also based on narrow understanding what democracy is, which I think connects to your point, that it's about elections electoral democracy, and not just even elections, because you're saying that there's all these elections, of course, land councils, mm. and so on, but there's elections for particular governmental entities. And really, in a way, if you want, I'm taking out this from the, I think the view is that the possibility in all this, and talking, the debating about the First Nations voice is actually reimagining a vision of, of the Australian democracy that comes to grips with colonization, that goes beyond just elections that happen, and that is satisfaction with elections not just for indigenous people, right? Mm. We all know that, right? Yep. Periodic yeah. election. So actually there's a real opportunity. So I've said it much, but let's let's Chief Chong, can I yeah. um, look I'd like to thank uh, Sana and Eddie for that. A, a very sobering assessment about the reality of choice to choose to be involved or not be involved in the electoral process. And that where decisions are taken nationally, decisions and actions are taken nationally, which have an implication that a lot of us, a lot of us don't consider on, on a daily basis. But then for me, in trying to provide a service, in this case, election services, uh, where, where I have to try and factor that in, and, and I can't necessarily change and or influence those higher level mm. factors yeah. that are at play. Yeah. Um, so that's a, you know, it's quite, a, quite a challenge yeah. uh, from my perspective yeah. in relation to the matters that you've raised. Yeah. Yeah.
reactions, responses? Um, I think the point you make about the Senate is really helpful um, because, you know, as you would have heard from what I speak, you know, I'm, I'm thinking very much at the um, House of Representatives level, right? But of course, you know, we think of that House as representative because of the one vote, one voter principle. Um, but of course, the practice of representation that's being produced in the Senate is different, you know, which is that you're there to represent state interests rather than the interests of your, your constituents as a collective of individuals. Um, so I think that's all true. I mean, I'm going to, and I, I appreciate all of that, and I appreciate what an electoral commissioner can do and what your remit is, and it is within the existing apparatus of democratic practice. I, I would sustain, I guess, my critique that there is an assumption that if we are represented, that justice, fair, equitable, mm -hmm. legitimate decisions will follow. And I don't accept that on stolen land that that is possible. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, um, I don't think that's a critique that says you don't pursue it. But I think it's about not um, selling the idea that if we are more perfectly represented, yeah. that the politics we are engaged in on a day-to-day -day basis, the political strategies that communities have, the forms of representation we produce within our own communities. I mean, the Torres Strait Regional Authority is like it's, you know, it has its own yeah. processes and um, so forth. We're doing this all the time outside of the existing apparatus um, because the apparatus has not been able to deliver anything. Um, we can perfect the apparatus, but I don't think it will, um, I don't think it alone will deliver what we need. So I am, I'm very much interested in the kind of reimagination of Australian democracy and what that, because I, my understanding of sort of settler colonial democracies around the world is that they can't let go of the idea that they have to make it right. You know, there is no justice on stolen land. It just isn't. Um, and I'm not looking for it. I'm looking for power. So I'm trying to figure out how to produce that within this context. I mean, colonisation is a harm that cannot be, cannot be undone. No. I mean, um, one can go towards reparations. Some things, some partial reparations, but the harm they cannot be undone. Right? Um, and so it's about preventing the future harms. Yeah, it's about getting the state off yeah, our necks. Yeah. 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 Comments? Okay. Please, I'm sure you're okay. Looks like you finished early, Ju Chong. No, 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 I'm sure. Uh, well, let, let me throw one in because, it, I mean, you said getting state off the next, but at the same time, I was thinking, well, at six is still part of the state, right? Just in a different configured form. So, um, so when we think about. But it was evolving, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. And, and it wasn't allowed to evolve because it started to get power, and, and actually, we might have started to get good at, you know, challenging government on. Yeah on what they were doing. Yeah, and things take time, right? Institutions take time to build and cultures and so on. I so mean, an example of, yeah. say, at the moment, we're, we're doing a refresh of the um, COAG and, um, and we're looking at a better engagement and working with Aboriginal people. Yeah. So at the front end, it, it's all looking great, but in the back end, we've, we've just, um, the Attorney General's department has basically ignored <coughs> their own independent um, report yet again. Yeah. And, um, has mainstreamed the Aboriginal Legal Services funding, yeah. which is contrary to everything they're saying about what they're doing here. I mean, this is the sort of thing that we, as Aboriginal people, have to put up with all the time. Yeah. And at the current, we just had a, re a report released by Andrew, Andrew Lee, I think it is, parliamentarian, yeah. econo economist, yeah. um, Labor parliamentarian, and he he's just did a report saying, 10 years ago, Indigenous Australians were 75% less likely to be incarcerated than black Americans. As of now, we're, we're past that. We're, we're past them. And so we're in a crisis, but government is, they, they're, they're having this front that, you know, we're working with the black fellas and we're gonna change things yeah. for the better. 
Yeah. But in the back door, they're just, um, mm. they're ignoring the biggest crisis in this country at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And, and then we can even go back to, I mean, I can just keep giving you these stats that, yeah. so since the apology, child removal has doubled, and it's probably our biggest issue in this country. And yeah. the, re the research says that once you're in um, a child protection order, you're gonna end up on juvenile justice orders. So, you know, these are the, this, yeah. this is the 3% of Australia fighting for these, these rights and, 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 and we, we, no matter who gets in, they, both major political parties are the same. Mm. I must say one thing I read um, last year that really struck me was a speech by Jim Oscar. It, was, um, I can't remember, it might have been a speech at the World Health Professional Association conference kind of thing. And uh, I must say, my ignorance, I didn't quite realise that they read this part. She said that for a lot of indigenous communities, it's in a condition of trauma, right? I mean, some of these communities, is, in the situation can be, anal uh, the analogy is between really communities recovering from serious civil conflict and yeah. conflicts with the, the state that's represented by the, by the government. And I think, you know, if that truth is taken more really seriously and all those things that follow, so many implications, of course, will follow from that. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you. Well, other people might know this as well. My, I, I have been wondering whether or not that if there had been a constitutional protection for Indigenous representation, in the way that the voice is proposed now, would that have prevented the dismantling of ATSIC? Because that's. I mean, isn't that part of the justification for the voice, which is that. In pr we don't want that you don't design the representative body and put that in the constitution. You say um, you constitutionally protect the right to be represented, accounting for the fact that 1.6 percent of the voting population can't be meaningfully represented, and that whatever's designed out of that as the representative body can't just be shut down, can't just be defunded. Could ATSIC have been saved? Uh, I'm no constitutional lawyer, but I mean, there's issues that the current, <laughs> the current government could just handpick who they want on, on something or not not fill it. Mm. If it's but it's theirs, they're not getting rid of it. It's, mm. But I, I'm not I'm not too sure. Yeah. Okay. No, I wonder about that. Yeah, but then if it wasn't funded, you could challenge it, right? If it's a con constitutionally protected right, you take that to the High Court and you say, if you, if you do not provide the capacity to produce a meaningful practice of this right, then, you know, it's unconstitutional. So it could be that defunding in the way that, and the various ways that ATSIC was dismantled could have... I mean, I don't know. These are the counterfactuals that, you know, we sort of find ourselves in trying to think through how a current proposal might operate. Um, and I'm not a constitutional lawyer, but... Well, I'm, I'm a constitutional lawyer. I tend to be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, often what is mooted is some kind of equality provision. Yeah? I mean, I'm, I'm actually a, a sceptic when it comes to judicial protection, right? Okay, because um, one is that equality, for example, is a good example. This could be very double-edged mm -hmm. for Indigenous people, right? So you might say, well, okay, this meant you, uh, you know, intervention or whether you're targeting indigenous people, okay, this is a good trick. But then when we deal with colonization, all right, you need to actually have inverted commas or will be criticized as special treatment. It's not special in the sense it's yeah. giving favors, but you've got to accommodate the fact that this, uh, that indigenous people have actually been dispossessed, right? But then, then the argument comes from equality against that, right? Uh, so I, I think, you know, it's moot mm -hmm. whether, you know, and whether the judges have the courage mm -hmm. to actually step up. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. I just wanted to offer a little bit. My name's James from the BEC. <coughs> Thanks to all the speakers. And, and I enjoy working in my role. I'm in outreach and I work with my colleague, Georgia and Lucas and, and others here, Abby. Yeah. Um, but just a couple of observations about what we were talking about. Yeah. Um, I worked during the last state election with a lot of uh, Aboriginal communities around Victoria in this outreach talking about the election and about voting and about um, everything from filling out a ballot to talking about some of these issues we've discussed and what's fascinating, this is anecdotal and again, no, mm. nothing quantitative about this, but the times that ATSIC was raised 
in terms of its demise being, to be graphic, the bullet that put down in these people their willingness to be involved in uh, elections. Right. It was a seminal moment for multiple people I talked to across the state. Mm. And another really interesting thing that further into my education, where philosophically I don't understand it, but until I spoke to people, mm. the linking of native title and the flow through that that gives the communities and where we saw where there was none yeah. and when we saw some examples of when there was thriving yeah. and talking about <coughs> the recent story about Oak Hume, um, mm -hmm. uh, that community there and mm -hmm. had a table. It's interesting, when I talk to them, they, they raise that as a real issue yeah. when they looked across the state at other peoples. Yeah. Just to note that that is all in that conversation and they, it's not about them being more in train with that, with elections, no. but it was interesting that they were very linked, mm -hmm. and, and it was interesting you raised that's it because that came up multiple times for me right. when talking to elders and communities. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, we talk a lot in political science about trust. You know, trust yeah. is a big theme yeah. around how yeah. co contemporary debates around electoral politics yeah. are being navigated, particularly in the context of. Donald Trump and Brexit and um, you know and I think for the indigenous community out the reservoir of trust is very small and it ha it is because of the voting exclusions trust has been built where trust exists it's been built elsewhere and ATSIC was at a point where trust had started to flow yeah. and the moment that trust started to build <coughs> momentum and cohere um, it yeah, it got dismantled. And the flow on for me was that these were elders. Mm -hmm. yeah. They ceased to be engaged. Yeah. And therefore, the people they spoke to were getting a message other than what they may have had should yeah. they have kept engaged. <coughs> and that's the flow on. And yeah. talking about the just yeah. the dominance of youth in the community. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's an important factor. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I will say I do vote. I missed my first election, but I do vote. But I also have lots of arguments with my family <laughs> up, right, about... I, yeah, and I actually, you know, this year, my parents live in Herbert, and yeah. it was a pretty tight election, and there were some serious <laughs> issues on the yeah. table in Queensland, and, you know, yeah, you think, yeah. I, I don't know if my father voted. Yeah, you tell, yeah. he says he voted for Clive Palmer. I don't know if he's having me on or if that's, you know, people protest, right? Yeah, yeah, and you yeah, raise yeah. literacy within our communities, but there is a literacy problem generally mm, that yeah. we're also addressing in the discipline, yeah. you know, which is that, you know, I, my partner and I are political scientists, academics, and, you know, every election, state or federal, you know, we write little summaries for all our friends about what the parties, you know, sustainable Australia is not the Greens. Send me that, okay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, so there is actually, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's such a, I mean, there's lots of work around this on democratic publicity yeah, yeah. and quality yeah, yeah. of information and yeah. stuff, but it afflicts us all. But, but would, would many Australians vote if they didn't get fined? You know, let's be honest. I didn't get fined when I missed my first election. Oh, I don't know how many. Well. Yeah. Was, was I don't think it's too right. 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 They would only vote because they think they get fined. $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20 Commonwealth, yeah. Commonwealth, it's not a... Yeah, but that, see, then there's a mis misunderstanding there. People think they're going to get fined hundreds. And oh, they... Right. Okay, mm -hmm. maybe, yeah, 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 yeah. And $20 fines can be problematic in parts of our community. Yeah, now, and then right? you end up in like, prison. Yeah, yeah. But on that point, when I was in Western Australia, we, as a matter of policy, we would not uh, we would not pursue remote communities because yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it just complicated yeah. an already difficult yes. life. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we didn't we didn't do that. Okay. I'm not uh, so generous uh, here in uh, metropolitan uh, Melbourne. Last <laughs> 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 uh, question or comment, please. Yeah. Sure. Hey, um, it's something that you brought up earlier. Um, I guess the difference between like equality and equity. How do you bring in equity? Understanding that. Uh, I mean, I think there is, in the standard account of representation in democratic theory, you know, there are sort of four standard um, things. And the last one is this idea of universal franchise as a form of political equality. So there's this, and for me, that's a bit of a conflation of procedure with 
uh, idea. It's the regulative and the normative kind of being conflated. Um, but there's been, I mean, in the scholarship, you have to pay your dues and so actually heaps of people have been trying to work against that standard account. So um, there, this is why we have innovations like citizen juries and consul consultative processes. So the idea that representation is more than a vote, it's, it's one form of representation, but there are many others. And so I think there is a reasonable understanding, you know, in the late 20th and 21st century that equity can't, equality can't be produced through procedure alone. Um, it's a much bigger project than that and you need to pull lots of different levers to be able to think about how to produce that rather than just, you, got, we, we, you have to stop searching for the single silver bullet. It's not there. I think that's the lesson. The Institute for Public Affairs, I'm sure you all know that one of the main arguments of putting against the First Nations voice is that this is contrary to political equality. And um, a few months back, I did a sort of presentation and said, what happens, what well, well, number of things happen, well, they're fallacious about this argument, right? Political equality is about equal moral status, yeah? Okay, it's, but it's, in our conventional understanding, it's been equated with a very narrow understanding of equality, which is about formal equality. Everybody's treated the same under the law. But of course, the, the problem is that our circumstances are all different, yeah? So problem number one is a very narrow understanding of political equality. But problem number two is the same issue that comes again with issue of this refusal to come to grips with the colonial present past, mm. right? Part of the circumstances of indigenous people, the circumstances have been different, it's because of colonization. So what does equal moral status require in that particular context? It's not about everybody being treated the same because the circumstances are different, yeah? Okay, it's something it's about representation in a meaningful way that might come, for you know, and it's not a silver bullet, it's one of many strategies that might come, for example, in the First Nations voice. Yeah. Okay, I think, uh, you please join me. That was, I think that was a really, really uh, Thank you. 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 Thank you.